The machine gun has long been an iconic entry to the most blockbuster of action movies and an essential part to any video game arsenal for decades. But as games have advanced, it can sometimes feel like the LMG has been left behind. So what then is the virtual legacy of the light machine gun? Why is it that so often it feels more like a souped up assault rifle rather than a belt fed banger? So many light machine guns in games feel like a different beast when compared to the real life versions they're built around. But to break down their virtual lives, we must also take a look at their real world role and how they're actually used. Broadly speaking, an LMG is simply a lightweight machine gun that can be operated by a single person with or without an assistant that can be carried with the user forward into action and often utilized for suppressing fire from a bipod in support of the user's squad. But these weapons have come a long way and lost a lot of weight since the inception of the machine gun over 100 years ago. In 1884, Hiram Stevens Maxim invented the first practical self-powered automatic machine gun, the Maxim gun. By modern standards, we would call the Maxim a heavy machine gun, as it was indeed heavy and required a team to operate and a platform to be mounted on. Fast forward 20 or so years to 1903, where French military theorists saw that during assaults, the machine guns they had were of little use as they were unable to be brought up alongside the attacking infantry. They determined that the machine gun must learn to walk. The classifications that we have today of light, medium and heavy machine guns are somewhat modern, although by the First World War, we had created the category of the light machine gun. It might be called something else, I think the Lewis gun was known as a light automatic gun at one point. But the key, the key point was that it was portable, something that a single soldier could operate, even if it was designed to be operated by two. The other mainly carrying and, and loading ammunition for the shooter, but a two-man team as opposed to a five or six-man team for something like a, uh, well, any of the Maxim pattern machine guns. Pretty quickly, just about all the forces in the First World War realized they would need something lighter to allow them to be more dynamic with their firepower. The Germans adapted the Maxim into the Maschinengewehr 08 or MG08, and then adapted that into the lightened MG0815 with a shoulder stock and pistol grip, while the British purchased the American Lewis gun, moving their heavier Vickers machine guns into a dedicated machine gun corps and issuing the new Lewis gun to a battalion's gunner teams. By the end of World War I, there was already a variety of light machine guns, from belt fed to magazine fed, and even a broad selection of calibers. The advantages and utility of the LMG was cemented into the world's armed forces during the interwar years and into the Second World War, where two of the most iconic machine guns of the time was the British Bren and the German MG42. The Bren gun was based off the Czechoslovakian ZB VC26. It was lighter and more maneuverable than many other machine guns, but its ability to deploy sustained fire was limited by their 20 round box magazines. Gunner teams did become very proficient in magazine changes and the process of reloading also allowed barrels to cool, meaning less barrel swaps in the field, but brief pauses of fire could leave an assaulting team vulnerable. This issue was less prevalent with the German belt-fed MG42, but the system was much heavier, required more men to crew efficiently, and the rate of fire at which they ate through ammunition meant that more rounds would be required to feed the weapon. And despite there being a quick change barrel system, the weapon overheating was still an issue. But what about in our video games? In classic games like Contra, picking up a machine gun would often just simply allow you to hold the fire button down and fill the screen with colorful, damaging pixels. While in Wolfenstein 3D, what the game calls a machine gun was a straight upgrade to the pistol, once again providing the player the option for more damage and automatic fire. For much of the timeline of video games, the machine gun was simply more bullets, faster. In so many campaigns, a light machine gun gave players the option to dial up the action, lean into the spray and pray playstyle, and create intense set pieces where you're defending a position or firing from a vehicle. But as shooters developed and started to feature a greater variety of weapons, it became more and more important that each of those types were balanced and felt varied in their handling and utility, especially when it came to multiplayer. Something that's very difficult to kind of account for in games is sheer weight of a of a light machine gun of, of, of any era. The trend is very much toward lighter, especially when rifle caliber ammunition becomes um, small caliber high velocity like 5.56. That does reduce the burden of the machine gunner, but still, that, that's still a hefty bit of kit. It's always gonna be heavier than a rifle of the same caliber. 
that's very hard to get across. Typically games will just give you a movement penalty while you have it equipped. The more milsim type games might give you that penalty just for carrying it, which is obviously more realistic, but a bit frustrating. That's one of the key ways to differentiate the thing and make it not just a, you know, an assault rifle with a ridiculous magazine. The distinction between an assault rifle and a light machine gun is an important one to make with many developers being careful that a machine gun doesn't steal the job of an automatic rifle, or vice versa. The magazine and rate of fire of a light machine gun offers a huge advantage to players, offering the potential of sustained fire and easier multi-kills, especially if your stream of bullets can penetrate cover. Of course, the drawback there is that a belt is much slower to reload than a magazine, but in many games, that just simply isn't enough of a downside as you've either got the cover of allies and obstacles, or you've died and are already respawning just a few meters away with a refreshed gun anyway. Or in the case of Rainbow Six Siege, where LMGs ruled the meta for months in 2022, you could feasibly kill every member of the team in a 5v5 without ever having the need to reload. It's fairly common to see LMGs having nerfs to their recoil, mobility, bullet spread, reload speed, and sometimes even damage with some light machine guns even doing different damage than the assault rifles that fire the same caliber. Sometimes these nerfs can go so far that the LMG can be outclassed by weapons like SMGs and assault rifles. This can be understandable at close ranges where your maneuverability is slow and your hip fire has a snowball's chance in hell at hitting your enemy, but these nerfs are felt even at medium ranges, where in theory, the virtual light machine gun should excel most of all. As shooters progressed, more customization was offered to players wanting to tinker with their weapons. But instead of adding something like a bipod, an accessory pretty essential to the efficient use of the real-world LMG, players would often favor options that would minimize the downsides of the light machine gun to better fit a game's meta. Slapping on or tearing off parts to make the LMG feel more like an assault rifle, just with more bullets. While these changes can often make it feel like the weapon loses some of its identity, both in form and in its function, a certain amount is necessary lest the LMG simply become a super assault rifle. Even if deep down many of us want that virtual fantasy of being the bullet spewing army of one, a battle cry in our chest, a machine gun in one hand, and belt of ammunition slung over the other. The classic Rambo. Now this is something that the more I've learned about the, the history of the use of, of the machine gun in, in warfare, the more it turns out people have actually done that. Bren gun in Malaya and Borneo, it was a sort of designated weapon for that role, either fired from the shoulder or fired from the hip. Because of the close quarters of the jungle, it was less of a concern that your accuracy would not be great, which it won't be if you're firing, especially from the hip. There aren't many light machine guns you can fire from the shoulder uh, with any kind of degree of, of accuracy. I'd be absolutely appalling at it, I'm not built for it. Uh, there certainly are soldiers who are built for it, so typically your Bren or, or whatever it might be would be issued to someone with the strength to actually not only carry it around all day, but to deploy it in that kind of fashion. If you're needing it in the assault, if you're needing it to break contact in a jungle ambush or something, you would absolutely do that. What you wouldn't do is fire it one-handed, uh, and the whole um, supporting the ammunition belt with the other hand is really just rule of cool. In a way, logical that, he'd, that he held it like that, but you'd never want to sacrifice the other hand off the gun. And you, yeah, you have to be at least as uh, built as Stallone circa 1985. And there aren't that many soldiers who are that strong. Many games have made concessions to fit them into the ecosystem of their multiplayer arsenals, while others will offer the light machine gun a use beyond just racking up kills or giving enemy snipers someone easy to shoot. Suppressive fire is defined as fire that degrades the performance of an enemy force below the level needed to fulfill its mission. Basically, people inherently don't want to get hit by a bullet and will instinctively put their head down or duck away to avoid that. It is a huge part of the LMG's history and place on the real world battlefield. But how do you portray the feeling of not wanting to be shot in a virtual experience that simply allows you to respawn? This has often left suppression mechanics feeling as confused as the weapons themselves. The first times I can remember utilizing suppression as a mechanic was in games like Full Spectrum Warrior in 2004 or the Brothers in Arms series in 2005. While each of their gameplay and settings were different, at their core there was a focus on suppression, fire and movement. The RTS Company of Heroes also has a suppression mechanic where infantry will become pinned down if taking incoming rapid fire and are unable to break away or find cover. Programming AI to take cover and fire blindly is one thing, but trying to apply a similar effect to a real human player is another altogether. An early and infamous example of this was with the launch of Battlefield 3. 
almost all weapons could apply suppression. Of course, it was easier with the heavier volume of fire an LMG offered, but regardless of source, the effects were intense. Your vision would blur, your scope would sway, your accuracy would plummet, and your character would even scream for help. It was somewhat effective as simulated suppression, but it was also so distracting and annoying to deal with, especially in a mainstream shooter. As the franchise continued, suppression was a little different in each game. While sharing the general effects of inhibiting your target's accuracy and senses, the mechanic was more focused on machine gunners and heavy weapons, with Battlefield V having its own machine gunner combat role specializing in suppression. The LMG being tied to a support class made a lot of sense in the Battlefield series, as it gave players a reason to keep that medium distance where the weapon excels, while also having extra responsibilities like supplying ammunition, using mortars, or building fortifications. Battlefield also gave an important incentive for applying suppressive fire to support your team in the form of suppression kill assists, as well as the accumulative ribbons and medals. While suppression in Battlefield has been a debated topic across the franchise, its utility means that it is all the more baffling that Battlefield 2042, a game with the largest maps in the franchise, chose to omit this feature. These little rewards meant that support players were more likely to engage in suppressing fire, team play, and the role of the LMG, rather than simply waiting for the kill shot themselves. From the games I've played, the suppression in more strategic or hardcore titles have much deeper effects on both tactics and player experience. The Armour series is one of the most popular military sim franchises, and through the series, Bohemia has aimed to make the experiences as authentic as possible. The Armour 3 Marksman DLC introduced bipods and AI suppression, meaning that players are able to add further tactical flexibility to their weapons and operations as the AI enemies would duck for cover, hit the deck, and struggle to return effective fire. Tactical FPS games like Hell That Loose or Squad have much more focus on their suppression systems when compared to more mainstream titles, where players under fire will feel more intense audio and visual feedback, as well as being less effective when returning fire. Insurgency Sandstorm adds more utility to their automatic fire as well as their LMGs through suppression, most prominently felt in the attack and defend game modes. A player's vision will tunnel somewhat, their ears may ring, their ability to aim suffers, and their character will even scream in panic. Escape from Tarkov might be pretty light on the amount of LMGs they offer right now, and in terms of gameplay mechanics, the suppression effect is a little more subtle, but much more intense is the effect being suppressed can have on the individual player themselves. As Tarkov can be a very punishing game, where one bullet can cause you to lose all your gear, quest progress, or time invested on that raid, the idea of dying, even virtually, is a much stronger emotional force. While in some ways the effect is more subtle than others, it is nonetheless interesting that games like Tarkov suppress the player, while others suppress the character. In this genre, it can only take a few bullet hits to take a player down. A death can have a much larger impact on both the team in-game or on the player themselves, from long respawn times and a long commute to the front lines to the player losing a character or equipment. These are psychological ways that, by design or not, can add potency to the suppression system, and in turn, why LMGs and suppression works more in the tactical sphere of games. Even titles like Foxhole, an action-based strategy MMO, adds broader utility to the light machine guns through leaning a little more into their real-world application and effects, allowing a huge number of players to utilize coordinated fire and advanced tactics or suppress enemy bunkers and trenches. These games are also played for the experience and feeling of them, with impactful and intense sound and visual design further immersing the players into that virtual battlefield experience. It's my belief that the more a player is immersed, the easier it is for elements like suppression or the tactical use of a light machine gun to make sense to the player, but also be felt by them. While the LMG has often struggled to find its place within games, with its portrayals varying potentially more than any other weapon type, its variety means that it has found a place on a broad spectrum of video games. Both gamers and developers understand the appeal and important variety in gameplay a light machine gun can offer. They're an exciting weapon to add to your loadout, so it makes sense that some titles have tweaked its power level to fit more neatly into their fast-paced games, while others may choose to lean more into reality and let the LMG fire away loud and free. The strategy and application that a player with an LMG in a milsim shooter can be just as satisfying and rewarding as getting a quad feed with your belt fed in Call of Duty or Battlefield. And for every action hero campaign, arcade FPS or arena shooter, we're starting to see more realistic depictions of battles, tactics, and of course, the light machine gun.
Thank you so much for watching this episode of Lowdown. I hope you enjoyed this look at one of the most fun, if maybe a little underrepresented guns in our games. If you did, make sure to like the video, leave your thoughts in the comment section below, and of course, subscribe for the rest of the series. Let us know what you'd like to see future episodes cover, and if you want more video game firearms content, you can watch the previous episode of this show or check out our weekly series of Firearms Expert Reacts, where I show our friends at the Royal Armouries a selection of guns from our favorite games. Until next time, I've been your host, Dave Jewett. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.